Great flag, flag. Okay, so welcome to Vibe, everybody. Uh, we're at Vibe Book and Music Shop. We're in Moiwo. We're on Lantau Island, and we're in Hong Kong. We're live on Facebook, so we're going out to the world, and we're also going to be uh, published on YouTube next week. So if you want to catch this talk, you can. Um, but first of all, uh, just on a, a slight down note, um, I want to dedicate today's show to a good and close friend, uh, Martin Molden. Um, Martin passed away two weeks ago, uh, walking the hills of uh, Lantau. And uh, Mar Martin grew up in Rhodesia amongst the wildlife and the snakes over there. And um, he used to come to every single thing and, and Saturdays he would be here for the last few years. So. Um, just want to say, uh, you know, lots of love to Martin, friends and family and dedicate today's show to them. All right, so um, here we go with, so Adam Francis, author and photographer, is here today to talk to us about snakes and his new book, Turtles. Great. Thanks very much, mate. Thanks so much, <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. So um, today's talk, we're going to go through um, a, a couple of different topics. Um, first and foremost, we're going to talk a little bit about the snakes in Hong Kong in general, um, which was the motivation for my first book. Um, we're then going to transition into talking a little bit about how I pulled the book together. Um, and uh, we'll close off uh, touching on my newest book, uh, which is also in the vein of reptiles and amphibians with the turtles of Hong Kong. So what I usually like to do when I start off talking to a group is find out how much they know about the subject matter I'm talking about, which helps me pace my way through the presentation. So everybody here is going to be under as much pressure as I am uh, on the next slide. And we're going to start with a little aptitude quiz. So question number one, we'll do show of hands so nobody gets called out individually. Um, how many species of land snake can be found in Hong Kong. So that's everything excluding sea snakes, um, which are very rare and arguably don't really occur too much in Hong Kong anymore. Is it 37? Show of hands. 43? Show of hands. We had one for 37. 43. We got a few. 56? The majority for 56. All right. So the few brave souls in the middle of the pack are correct. It's 43 species. Now this is a tricky one. For the people who said 56, you may have been counting sea snakes, and there's also a number of dubious records um, for snake species in Hong Kong where some naturalists found a jar in the Natural History Museum of London and the label said Hong Kong, and so they attributed the species to Hong Kong. So I've done everybody the courtesy in my book of weeding out the dubious records. Um, so, number two, how many dangerously venomous species? Now, one person in the room knows this because I told him when he walked in, um, and I won't say who that is. Um, but let's see a show of hands for four dangerously venomous snakes. One, two. How many for 12? One, nine. Smart room. Nine is the answer. And you still voted even though you knew the answer. <laughs> oh, that's, that's very, very considerate. Um, so uh, nine species of dangerously venomous. We'll, we'll talk a little bit about what I mean by dangerously venomous uh, in a moment because that's also a very important distinction. Um, but let's move on to the next question. What is the largest venomous snake in Hong Kong? Uh, show of hands for King Cobra. About three quarters of the room. Uh, Chinese Cobra. One <coughs> Burmese Python. Oh, nobody fell for the trap. That's, I, I always try and go for the trap on that one. So uh, pretty much everybody was right. The answer is King Cobra. And the trick here is venomous. Uh, the Burmese Python is not venomous, but it is actually the largest snake in Hong Kong. And I think the biggest on record now um, was captured by Dave Willett, and it was 4.64 meters um, for the Burmese python. And for anyone who knows anything about Burmese, when they're that big, they get really, really hefty as well. So really impressive animals. But the kings get upwards of four meters as well. Um, not as heavy bodied. Um, and outside of Hong Kong, they get longer than four meters. Um, so I'm not sure what the biggest one here is. The biggest one I've seen is probably about three in a little bit. Um, but really, really large venomous snakes and really impressive. Um, all right, so now the last question, this is the toughest. Where can you find snakes in Hong Kong? This is the one where you're allowed to just shout it out. So who's got ideas? Everywhere. Everywhere, 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 everywhere. 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 All right, so I should never do these presentations in Moi Wo, especially not on Lantau, um, because people actually do know the answer. And the answer literally is everywhere. Um, and I say that without being facetious at all. There's um, 
a number of snakes. I live on Hong Kong Island, and we found snakes uh, in the city in Wan Chai. You find them uh, uh, 10 minutes into the jungle pass, uh, right off the main living areas. Um, and the fact of the matter is they're cryptic species, which means they like to hide. And so even if they're around, most people aren't going to see them. And we've even got a couple of people in the room here that mentioned they'd never seen snakes in all the time they've lived in Hong Kong. Um, whereas I'm coming off a walk from last night where we found seven in a five kilometer stretch. So uh, snakes are everywhere in Hong Kong, um, which is actually one of the big motivations behind the book and some of the other things I've done. So with that, um, let's launch into the agenda for today. So a few of the things I want to cover. Um, this is basically constructed off um, a framework I created based on the questions I get having since having published the book. Um, so I'm going to talk about who I am for like like a slide and a half really quickly just for some context because people always want to know how somebody gets into a project to document and make a book on snakes. Um, so I'll try not to be too self-indulgent and we'll move on very quickly um, to talking about the animals themselves um, here in Hong Kong. And then we'll talk about um, how we pulled the book together and I'll close really briefly on the newest book that I've produced because I actually think it um, covers a really Im important subject matter in terms of Hong Kong's wildlife um, and has some implications globally too, a really special species and, and they're worth some attention. So without further ado, let's jump in. So who am I, or more importantly, how does somebody get motivated to do anything related to snakes? Um, well, normally when I do presentations like this, I show up in a suit. I refuse to come to Moi Wu in a suit on a weekend. Um, but this slide's a lot more amusing when I do. Um, and uh, normally I stand here in a suit and I say, yes, I have a day job and I do other things aside from wildlife photography and writing books on wildlife. And most of the time when people see me, I look like this and I'm in a setting that looks far more like this. Um, so that's me in my outdoor gear, walking a stream, looking for actually one of the last elusive species of snake I haven't personally found um, and documented. So um, that's me in my heart of hearts, um, but I do wear a suit sometimes. Um, more importantly, um, let's talk a little bit about my passion for herpetology. So everybody know what herpetology is? Okay, so um, herpetology is the study of reptiles and amphibians. Um, it's interesting because amphibians have almost nothing to do with reptiles. They just clump them all together. I think mostly because you find them in similar environments and people that study one vein end up seeing a lot of species from the other. Um, but they're very distantly related. So um, regardless, uh, this is kind of a passion that I developed um, at a young age. Um, and uh, I had some very specific motivations. Now. Um, some people are lucky in life, they have passions that they don't have to search for. Um, the passions find them. Uh, other people find them throughout the course of their life. Some people create them uh, throughout the course of their life. I was one of the very lucky ones where from a very early age, for some reason, I was always fascinated um, by cryptic species. And snakes and lizards um, and turtles in particular were something that I was just always fascinated could exist in reality in the wild. Um, and so I was driven um, in my younger years to do a little bit more in the term, in the field of, uh, uh, looking for, uh, reptiles and amphibians, which is from the previous slide, we mentioned something called herping. Um, it's kind of a colloquialism. So, um, taking herpetology to study, um, turning it into an action, the action of herping, looking for reptiles and amphibians, um, as kind of a hobby. Uh, so some of my big motivations growing up were, uh, field guides. Uh, funny enough, I think we can see from the very start how this might tie around to something else we'll talk about today. Um, but I actually used to lie in bed flipping through field guides as a young kid, and I would see pictures of wildlife, and I would be shocked that something, when you look at it in photos, you say, why would nature make that and have it be so bright in color and so bizarre in shape? Like, how is that real? And then I'd, I'd look at the range maps. Where can they be found? Some of them I'd say, you can find them where I live if I look hard enough and figure out where they live. And I said, I can't believe there's an animal that just lives in the wild like that, that I could go find. And it's gonna be sitting there pink or blue or yellow or whatever. Um, and I could observe it and, and you know, uh, get to learn more about it just by looking for it. That was always amazing to me for some reason. Um, and actually in particular, this book here, I used to fall asleep uh, reading at night. This is the uh, Audubon Field Guide to Reptiles and Amphibians of North America. Um, I think it's specifically to the U.S. actually, 
Um, but U.S. is a big country, lots of different habitats, so very big variation in the kinds of species you can get. And I'd flip through these hundreds of pages looking at these animals and be amazed. So um, that was a big driver early on, and I had parents that were cognizant of my interest as well and provided the books, which was great. Um, I also grew up during a time when uh, there happened to be some popular media um, uh, growing that talked a lot about wildlife in a visual format, so television, um, and people on television who became quite famous for um, presenting on animals, finding them in the wild. Um, I think most of these faces will be recognizable, certainly the last two. Everyone know who this is? Steve Irwin, Steve Irwin the crocodile hunter, Attenborough. Sir David Attenborough, uh, the goat. Um, this guy? This is Mark O'Shea. Um, so Mark O'Shea is a world-renowned herpetologist. Um, he is a full-on scientist, accredited. Uh, he also had some shows on Discovery Channel uh, for a number of years. I believe they were in maybe the early 90s. Um, and uh, he was doing similar stuff to Steve Irwin. Uh, in fairness, Mark was actually much more scientifically bent in his presentation. There was a little bit of drama in his shows as well, but um, uh, he was very uh, scientific and professional. Steve Irwin was a bit more like the average herper, um, just a life passion for it. Um, not particularly a scientist, but overwhelmingly enthusiastic about finding animals and sharing them with the world. So in addition to the visual guides I had um, and the reinforcement at home, I also had people in a big media space that were reinforcing the fact that it's not overly bizarre. There's other people that find this stuff interesting as well and are mesmerized by the wild world and nature and um, they're making TV shows. So, you know, wow, that's really, really encouraging. So, um, Life took me in different directions. Um, I ended up uh, uh, establishing a professional career. I did work in finance, um, a number of other projects, but the passion never died. Um, and I kindled my interest in wildlife through photography in more recent years. I would say the last five or six years. Um, I really tried to take up the mantle of learning how to photograph animals properly because that was always the thing that amazed me the most, the beautiful photographs. I wanted to be able to do something similar. And in the modern world of social media, it also gave me a conduit to share that work um, uh, with the wider world. So um, we'll get into a little bit about how all that helped manifest into the book. Um, but before we do that, I kind of wanted to touch on the very interesting topic of snakes in Hong Kong. Um, I think it'll hopefully uh, reinforce, even if it doesn't stir passions in you, um, it'll help you tap into the passion that I have for these animals um, and talking a little bit more about them. And most people that, especially people that are a little bit uninitiated, are quite shocked to learn some of the facts, um, how many we have, um, what types they are, where they can occur, what they do, so on and so forth. So without further ado, let's dive in. So when we talk about the book, we'll talk a little bit about the structure, but one of the things I wanted to make sure I did um, was create it in a way that it was accessible to the layperson. So somebody that might hate snakes, somebody that might love snakes, um, nobody needs to have uh, a PhD in zoology, herpetology, or otherwise to be able to pick up and use the book immediately and find the information accessible and useful. At the same time, there is enough credible information in there where it did pass muster with all of my scientist friends um, so that we know that it's actually accurate, useful information as well. Um, but one of the big things that I wanted to do to make it easier and more relevant for people, normally in a scientific text and often in field guides, species will be organized by scientific taxonomy, um, organized by genus, um, and then following on by species. Um, and that's all well and good, but what is the main thing somebody wants to know when they see a snake? You can just shout out. When you see a snake on the trail, what do you want to know first? What is, it? Kill me. is it venomous? Is it, is it dangerous? Is it something that I need to be worried about? That's really the first thing on people's minds every single time, without fail, unless you're like me, um, and you just want to photograph it and pick it up and do all kinds of bizarre things with it. Um, okay, so get rid of it. <laughs> yeah, that, that happens as well. And, but if you learn more, you'll realize getting rid of it's never really a big deal. Um, but that's the main structure by which I organize the book. So venomous and dangerous. Again, we'll talk a little bit more about that on the following slide. Venomous and not dangerous, that confuses people. Um, so we'll explain that a little bit. And non-venomous, which are the vast majority of snakes in Hong Kong. Um, so this is a, a big motivator for structure of the book, and it's also something I like to lead with um, in talking specifically about our species in Hong Kong um, so that people have a better idea on what's out there and what the implications are. So let's talk really quickly about the hot topic, and I use that word interchangeably. If you guys were snake nerds, that would be a funny joke. 
um, because in the snake community you call dangerously venomous snakes hots. Uh, super hot, the venom super hot. Anyways, um, moving on. Um, so, uh, venomous and dangerous snakes in Hong Kong. Um, we have nine. You can argue at least one of these as being possibly not super dangerous. Uh, the rest are all definitively dangerous, but what does that mean? It means if you get bit, you need to get right to the hospital. Um, does it mean you're going to die? Um, tough question. Envenomations are dynamic situations. Um, you can't predict anything when it comes to them, um, but you can lean a little bit on statistics. Uh, I think back in 2013, there was something like 15 million hikes a year in Hong Kong, so number of times people would go out on the trails, something like that. In more recent years, it's absolutely exploded with the COVID years and all this other stuff. I would say conservatively, we probably see 20 million hikes a year. Um, it may be quite a lot more than that. And of all those hikes, who wants to guess on average how many actual envenomations there are in a given year? 100. 100? Very conservative. 10, even more conservative. The truth is just about in the middle. It's around 30 actual envenomations, 60 to 100 bites, um, but you can be bit and not be envenomated by a venomous snake. Um, there's a, what we call a wet bite and a dry bite. Wet bite, they envenomate, dry bite, no venom. Um, there's about 30 to 60 envenomations a year, and they're effectively all from one snake on this uh, chart. Anyone know which one? BPV, bamboo pit viper. Anyone know why? Ambush predator. So its main defense is to sit still and hope you don't see it. So that works fine 99.9% .9 of the time because this is also one of the most numerous venomous snakes, one of the most numerous snakes in Hong Kong. And almost nobody gets bit by them. Um, the people who do are the very, very unfortunate few who happen to be walking home in a rural area at night and grab the gate without looking or using a torch and there's a BPV sitting there and they actually physically grab the snake and it bites them. Somebody is turning a log over in their backyard, putting on a shoe that was on outdoors, sitting down in the grass after a hike and you're actually physically bumping into the snake. It's almost unheard of for them to strike without actually being physically bumped. Um, it can happen, but you'd have to be very, very close. Um, and how many people a year die from bamboo pit viper bites? Three. Three? Um, Zero. Zero. We haven't had a death from a native snake species in Hong Kong. I think it was in the 40s um, there was a death. There was a death in between then from a snake soup shop that imported a venomous snake, a Russell's viper from India, which is a horrible, horrible venom. Um, and we don't have anti-venom here for that because it's not a local snake. And they waited to go to hospital because it was an illegal import and all kinds of silliness. Um, and it was very unfortunate, but they didn't make it. But in terms of local snake bite deaths, on record, I think the last one was from this little bandy boy up here, the many banded crate. And it was, unfortunately, I think the story was uh, 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 a kid had found one and was playing with it all afternoon until it finally bit him um, after playing with it for a few hours and they didn't realize. And, um, uh, you know, that was quite a long time ago well, as well in terms of medical intervention and general information. But if you think about this, nine species that are, have medically significant bites is what we'll call them, 30 to 60 envenomations a year, no deaths, and virtually all four recoveries. I know there are some people that have had BPV bites that a little bit of lingering uh, damage and things like that. But generally speaking, snake bites are a zero concern in Hong Kong. Statistically speaking, um, that's certainly true. From an individual perspective, I know it's a, it's a very challenging thing to have to deal with a snake bite. But... All that said, I think it summarizes what we mean by dangerous. Dangerous doesn't mean that these snakes are actually dangerous in Hong Kong and should be considered a dangerous category of animal. It means they have the possibility of being dangerous if you're very, very unlucky and are bitten, which is incredibly unlikely. So if you're not handling them, if you're paying attention to your surroundings, the chances of being bitten is very, very, very slim here. Um, let's talk a little bit really quickly about um, what it means to be dangerously venomous, now that we've given it proper context. So dangerously venomous, as I mentioned, it would mean a medically significant bite, something you'd have to get treated professionally. Um, and if you don't, you'd probably have some serious damage or it could even be lethal. Um, so how many of these snakes really are lethal in the context of being dangerous? Potentially, 
you've got these two at the top, which are our two species of crate. Um, crates are from the elapid family. Those are snakes characterized by short, fixed front fangs that do not hinge like vipers do. Um, and normally they have uh, significant um, uh, components of the venom that are made up of neurotoxins. So uh, venoms that affect your nervous system in one way, shape, or form. Uh, this snake in particular, the many-banded crate, has a very um, unique form of neurotoxin categorized as its own a category called bungarotoxin. Um, and it's a pre- and postsynaptic neurotoxin. So nerves fire uncontrollably at one end and are blocked from the receptor at the other end and your nervous system shuts down. Very slow acting, usually an hour or two before symptoms occur. Um, and often people can survive these bites just by being on a ventilator. Uh, not something I would recommend trying, um, but um, given the intensity of the venom, it's actually um, a relatively decent prognosis. Well, potential for a decent prognosis. Um, these two snakes are also elapids along with this one. Um, does anyone know what this is? Chinese. Chinese cobra, exactly. One of our other most common venomous snakes. Uh, this one? King. King cobra. King cobra, which ironically is not a cobra. Um, and this? That's our coral snake, exactly, exactly. So coral snake is also an elapid. Um, and uh, yeah, these snakes, their venom is, um, is uh, very significant. You definitely want to be in the hospital if there's a, a bite, but Nobody seems to be getting bit by them. Um, and there's, I think, a lot of good reasons for that. These snakes tend to be out at night. Um, they tend to be very reluctant to bite. Um, uh, these snakes are diurnal. And often diurnal snakes are warmed up by the sun. Um, and they tend to move pretty quickly if they see something larger coming through. Uh, so oftentimes you won't even see them because they'll feel you coming and skedaddle uh, before you even get close, especially the kings, which are incredibly fast, incredibly intelligent animals that want nothing to do with people. Um, and the McClellans are a very, very cryptic snake. Um, so they're, I would call, uh, maybe subfossorial is a good category for them, which means fossorial is something that lives underground. Um, so subfossorial, I would say, is something that lives underneath things and spends a lot of time under leaf litter and in the dirt um, and things like that. It's usually hunting small snakes like blind snakes um, and uh, other animals like that. Another interesting category that we'll get into on another uh, slide, which is uh, um, uh, something called uh, a, a snake behavior called Ophiophagus, um, which is the genus name for this snake. Um, we'll, we'll explain that later. Um, so these other three snakes um, here in the corners are vipers. Um, this one everyone knows. Um, these two almost nobody knows. Uh, does anyone know what this is? Mountain. Mountain pit viper, exactly. There's somebody who's been in the books. Um, so um, mountain pit viper is a very, very, um, it's an uncommon snake. I would categorize it as highly localized. So there's only a couple spots they can be found. And they have very odd behaviors. Now, do snakes like warm weather or cold weather? Warm weather, why? They're cold blooded. They can't regulate their own body temperature for the most part, right? So they need ambient temperature to be to a certain level to metabolize food and move around and all that kind of stuff. These snakes, the only time you can really find them is in the dead middle of winter at the tops of mountains, usually in the rain. Um, I usually find them when it's 12 or 13 degrees out and drizzling. Um, and I've never found them in warm weather. Um, so very, very interesting animal. They are super cryptic. They like to live in rock crevices. They only ever come out, I would hypothesize, during uh, breeding season. And when I'm seeing them, it's usually the males and um, my theory is that the males are going a bit crazy and trying to find the females, and it's the one time you see them out and about. Um, you'll be the death of us all, I promise. Um, <laughs> and uh, hard, I, I, for real. Um, so really interesting species. This is, um, anyone know? Ah, interesting. Well, this snake is called the habu, or pointed, pointed scale viper. And the cat snake, which we'll get to on the next slide, is what we call a Batesian mimic of the habu. So it, it, it looks a lot like a very dangerous snake. Um, this is a dangerous snake. Um, this is a terrestrial viper, a viper that likes to be on the ground, as is this. Um, and they're super, super localized. Only one general location where you can find them in Hong Kong. And a lot of theories as to why that is. But that's one of the main reasons why they're not really encountered. Certainly one of the reasons why people don't get bit. Where's the location? I usually try not to say locations because we do have still a very big problem with poaching um, in Hong Kong. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that when I talk about turtles where it's an even more serious issue. Um, 
The last one is the debatable one. Anyone know this? Redneck, Redneck keelback. That's, I, I mean, arguably the most commonly encountered snake on Lantau, um, and definitely one of the most common in Hong Kong. And what's special about it? Venomous and poisonous. Very confusing, and, and uh, scientists and other people like to get very picky when you call a snake poisonous instead of venomous, and they yell at you online, and it's a terrible shambles of a conversation. Um, really, effectively, venom is kind of poison, so let's not split hairs. What does it mean in this context? Let's just clarify venomous versus poisonous. Venomous, introduce it to your bloodstream, it's a problem. Poisonous, ingest it, it's a problem. Um, so poisonous in your bloodstream, eh, no big deal. Venom, swallow it, no cuts in your mouth, yeah, you're probably fine. So it's the, the method of introduction and the way they behave once they enter your body. Yeah, the way, that, the way the toxins work, um, one needs to go through certain uh, parts of your body to take effect and the other goes through other parts of your body to take effect. And the redneck is super, super interesting because it is venomous, but it's highly inefficient in delivering that venom. It has rear fangs. It does not have muscle around its venom glands to squeeze and shoot the venom out. It just has little kind of like ducts. And when it starts chewing on something, venom slowly starts to drip out and eventually it'll get into its prey item. Um, and the venom is uh, supposedly quite toxic, uh, but there's not a great amount of study on it, and the few instances where people were actually uh, injured by the venom, they were usually keepers, they were being bit for extended periods of time because they didn't want to hurt the animal by pulling it off, and all kinds of things went wrong. In terms of this animal's danger in Hong Kong, I don't know there's ever been a case of an envenomation, um, even by people who've been bitten. Um, I wouldn't recommend it, um, but... Um, I, I think their label as a dangerous snake, they would be potentially, possibly, maybe, kind of, sort of dangerous if you're very silly. Um, so uh, the poison is a really interesting thing, though. They have nuchal glands. These are glands located on the back of the neck. Um, and inside those glands is a poison that they sequester from their favorite food item, the Asian common toad. Um, and this has been proven not in our specific species of redneck keelback, but in a related species, the tiger keelback, um, where they actually did studies about um, snakes, uh, hatchlings that were born from mothers that had been ingesting toads and ones that hadn't, and the ones that were born from snakes that had been ingesting toads had the venom or had the poison glands in their neck. Um, they burst those glands if they're grabbed, and the poison comes out just like it does on a toad. Little white poison starts bubbling up from the back of the neck. Um, so super interesting snake. Uh, potentially dangerous enough to make the list. Um, not a super risky snake, um, if you ask me. Everything's risky if you're irresponsible with it, as a footnote. Um, but generally speaking, the statistics prove that even our dangerous snakes tend not to be that dangerous in effect. Venomous, but not dangerous. How is that possible? Anyone have a guess? Venom's not super strong. Simple as that. Why could that be the case? Usually because it's targeted at something that doesn't have the same DNA as a human. Um, so a mock viper, for example, this little one and that one, they're highly variable, lots of different colors, very cool species. Um, they have a bite where if a human's bit, it's kind of itchy uh, for most people. Anybody can have an allergic reaction just like to a bee sting. But for the average person, a bite's going to be a little itchy, kind of like a mosquito bite, then it'll go away um, pretty quickly. To a gecko, it's pretty bad news. Um, and it'll take a gecko down pretty quickly um, when it's envenomated. So, uh, venom fit for species, venom as kind of a um, non-main uh, uh, part of the attack profile for securing prey, um, maybe part of the early digestion process more than the subduing process, all different reasons why that can be the case. But effectively, um, these snakes' venoms, if you're bitten by them, are not going to produce any major effects. You could arguably get away without going to hospital. Maybe you'd go if you were very, very um, uh, cautious. Um, but um, I won't admit to being bitten by any of these, um, but I can say that it's probably likely that if you were, none of them would really produce terrible symptoms. Um, this one would probably produce symptoms like uh, mild altitude sickness in some people. Um, this one, mild euphoria. Um, I don't recommend it in place of a beer, um, but uh, also some localized pain and swelling, so you'd kind of have to take the poison pill with the beer. Um, this one, very similar to the mock viper. These are a little bit unstudied. This is a mangrove water snake. Um, not a lot's known about them. They're estuarine. They live in um, uh, marine marshes and things like that. Anything that's close to salt water, I tend to get a little bit iffy on whether I'd 
uh, want to um, inadvertently be exposed to its uh, not dangerous venom, um, but uh, supposedly not too bad. Um, so that's an interesting explanation there. I do have to pick up the pace a little bit, I think. Um, so non-venomous. So we only have four non-venomous snakes in Hong Kong. I'm just kidding. There's so many I can't fit them on a single slide. Um, so I have to reference back to my website. Um, and um, uh, there's uh, the vast majority of snakes here are non-venomous. Um, they're not dangerous, aside from the python, which is a very large snake. So if you were bitten by that one and um, it wasn't handled properly, you might have to go get some treatment for the bite. Um, but aside from that, even being bitten by these is really not going to result in much more than a little bit of blood um, and maybe a little bit of surprise from the person who was bitten. Um, although a little bit of a caveat, these guys, the kukris, um, they have a super interesting rear fang, um, or rear tooth, I should say, that's been developed for slicing into eggs. So instead of just being like a little needle, like most snake teeth, it actually is a little bit more like a little blade. Um, and they give nice, really clean cuts, um, and they have a little bit of anticoagulant in their saliva, so you bleed quite a lot. Um, and not one that I'd recommend free handling, um, but uh, also not, not a super dangerous snake, also not highly prone to bite. Um, but yeah, so if they don't have venom, um, what do they do to defend themselves is a question that people like to ask. Um, a little bit of a tangent, but I thought I'd like to answer that because some of these are, are surprising, some are not. So defensive behavior, the number one for pretty much all snakes that aren't ambush snakes is running away. And they're really good at it, which is why lots of people have never seen snakes before. And most people have only ever seen a few unless they really know how to find them. Um, they do bite. All snakes are capable of biting. Even little blind snakes, um, uh, which look like little worms, um, are capable of biting. Uh, it doesn't mean it's an effective defense, but they all have mouths so they can bite technically. Some of them bite more vigorously. These guys... Um, tend to bite a lot um, as a defensive uh, mechanism. Um, the other main thing they do, they can do other things like they rattle their tails in the leaves to kind of freak you out a little bit. They can roll over and over like a, like a crocodile doing a death roll. When they grab prey, they like to roll over and over. Snakes can do a lot of that kind of stuff as well and make their head come up and look menacing. These are the main defenses. This last one, most people don't know about. Anyone know what musking is? Giving off some or noxious. Exactly. Uh, Exactly. It's producing a noxious odor, something that smells bad. Um, and pretty much every snake species is capable of musking in one way, shape, or form. Um, and each of the musks tend to be a little bit unique. Uh, sorry, unique between species, not between individuals. That's an interesting point. Um, but you've got some that are really mild. They musk a little bit, and you're kind of like, yeah, no big deal. And some of them musk, and you really just don't want to be in the same vicinity as the snake anymore. Um, it can be really, really intense, um, and that surprises a lot of people. I was out on a walk with uh, William Sargent the other night, um, and we had a group with us that we were um, uh, introducing to the world of wild snakes, and there was one species in particular that must a little bit, and everyone was quite shocked um, that snakes can be stinky. Um, so, it's again, it's a defensive behavior, so if they don't feel threatened, they're not doing it. Um, and most of the times, if you're at birthday parties and somebody brings... Uh, the animal crew to let you hold snakes and things like that, those snakes are not musking because they don't feel threatened, generally speaking. Um, even those snakes are going to be capable of doing it if they get nervous. Um, so there's a lot of other things they can do as well, but those are the ones I like to mention. They're the most common. Um, and like I said, the only one of the non-venomous that you really want to be careful of, if there's a four-meter python, try not to get bit by it. Um, maybe it goes without saying. Um, so let's keep going. Um, uh, really quickly, I'll go through these things because um, I do want to get into talking a little bit about the creation of the book. Um, you know, snake behavior is quite interesting. And, and like anything, most people realize in this day and age with information so available that um, there's a lot we actually don't know about things until we start looking into it. And then when we do, we find out there's a lot of depth and breadth um, to everything. And there's some interesting things worth note here. So why is um, snake behavior so interesting? Why is it important maybe to consider them in their place in the ecosystem um, rather than as something to be removed or, or gotten rid of? Um, you know, first and foremost, they're usually top predators um, or very close to. Um, you know, raptors, uh, big birds, uh, when it comes to snakes up to a certain size, might be the top predators around here. Um, maybe something like leopard cats, um, some of the predatory mammals. Um, but they're pretty high up on the list um, of predators in the food chain here in Hong Kong. Um, and that has an impact. Um, is it good or bad? We can leave that out and everybody can decide for themselves, but it's a real impact. So um, they eat rodents. A lot of them eat rodents. Um, and 
Rodents are useful, interesting, and valuable as well, but like anything, if they go unchecked, it can be a problem for them as well as the other species in the environment around them, including humans. Nobody wants to think about rats running through their house any more than they do venomous snakes. Um, also, funny enough, some snakes eat bugs. Did anyone know that? No? This one in particular is quite famous for eating bugs, even into adulthood. Some small snakes eat bugs because that's the best thing they can get their mouths on. But this is a golden cougar. Anyone know what they like to eat? Big fan of spiders. Yeah. Yeah. So what do you like less, snakes or spiders? It's kind of a terrible decision to have to make, I guess. But if you had to choose, these are very inoffensive snakes. Um, and they do eat insects. They're known to eat insects. And spiders tends to be one of the items that they've been known to eat. Um, you know, the other thing is they're, they're very cryptic. Um, so they stay out of our way by nature. It's how they hunt for food. Um, it's how they stay away from predators. It's how they like to spend time and recuperate and relax. That's why sometimes people who keep snakes, they have them in tanks and they're under a little log and people say, oh, that's very mean. And yeah, there's a debate there for sure. It's a reasonable debate to have. The reality is a happy snake in the wild is one with a full belly that's wedged under a log in a place where the temperature is not fluctuating very much and it can sit there for two or three weeks and not have to move while it digests its meal. That's a very happy snake. Um, and so, you know, that kind of behavior lends itself towards this type of an animal and these, these animals as a category being one that can actually exist pretty harmoniously with people because we don't interact very much. Um, going back to the bite statistics and the number of people that have seen snakes, it all kinds of stacks up. Um, they're also really clean animals. I don't know how many people have actually held snakes or engaged with snakes. Their entire bodies are made out of keratin, right? Like our fingernails. And like under the fingernail, sure, that can get a little bit grimy sometimes, um, especially for people like me. Um, the top of the nail is usually, you know, pretty self-cleaning. Everything kind of rubs off it. And that's what a snake's entire body is made up of. No fur for little things to get hung up in. Um, you know, really kind of self-cleaning animals. Also, their genetics aren't very close to us and mammals in general. So there's not really a lot of concern in terms of transmission of disease. Um, between snakes and people as well. So it's also something people don't think about. Some of these furry friendly animals we share a space with, you know, like a palm civet, very charismatic, funny looking animal. Is there a chance that there could be some kinds of disease transmission between a palm civet and a human? Uh, probably not super likely, way more likely than the transmission of a disease between a snake and a human. Um, so we're thinking of in relative terms as well. Um, let's keep going here. I put animations in to try and look like I'm tech savvy, but it really just ruins the flow sometimes. Um, <laughs> delay for dramatic effect. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about the, the meat of uh, how we pull a book like this together, Finding Snakes in Hong Kong. Um, how many people here have seen more than 10 snakes in the wild in Hong Kong? We got half the room. That's really good. Um, so how many of you are looking for them when you find them? Okay, just lucky people. On the trails? A lot of trail runners? Okay, okay. So outdoorsy people. That's already pretty good. You're going to see them without even looking, without even trying. Um, so, um, you know, you have, even being on the trails, you have to be observant to actually see them. You know, you can walk right by them, and I've seen people do it. I've done it. Um, I try not to make a habit of that, though. Um, so finding snakes in Hong Kong is actually kind of a... Uh, an interesting thing to do. Um, you can make missions out of it. And we'll talk a little bit about how you'd structure your mission if you're trying to pull something like this together. So the first step is learn their basic behaviors. So if you're trying to pull a book together, you got to get all the species, which means the common ones you're going to find real quick. And then you're going to have to actually start intentionally looking for some species that aren't just going to cross your path in your day to day. Um, so you really need to learn their behavior. Are they diurnal or nocturnal? They come out during the day or the night. Um, are they terrestrial, fossorial, aquatic, arboreal? Are they in the trees, on the ground, under logs, in the rivers? Um, you know, uh, diurnal and nocturnal, the main categories people like to talk about, but there's also snakes that are out in the transition periods, crepuscular snakes, transition from uh, evening to morning and afternoon to evening. Um, middle of the night snakes, snakes that don't care, that you'll find all, all the time. Um, learning these behaviors is actually really, really important um, if you wanna have success in targeting the less common species, the highly localized species, so on and so forth. Um, bit of a teaser on this page, there's a species that is not in here, that is new to the scientific record in Hong Kong and um, identified as genetically distinct, but not quite finished with description. So I'll leave that hanging. There'll be another book in the future. Um, 
So, um, in addition to learning their behaviors, um, you have to know where they are, uh, and that can be broken down into three major categories. So, um, for a lot of the widespread species, the common species, you look for generally good conditions. So anything where there's a little bit of water, a little bit of hiding places, greenery, and you'll probably have luck with a lot of those super, super common ones like the redneck keelbacks, the Taiwan kukris, um, maybe even the Chinese cobras. Then there's snakes um, that really only occur in specific kind of stretches, like maybe just in the new territories. And you need to know if you're looking for those species, like a diamondback water snake, for example, you're not going to find it on Hong Kong Island up by the peak. Um, you could look there for a million years and you'll never come across one. So you need to know the general range of that species. The range is quite broad. Um, uh, the type of conditions are very specific, but they're, they're very findable in that broad range. Then you've got highly targeted species. So these are species with very, very limited ranges, very restricted habitat. Um, and if you don't know where that restricted habitat is, you're never going to find them. So uh, breaking down the locations is another uh, key way to go about that. I won't get into the specific hows. Again, we have a bit of a poaching concern here. Um, uh, sometimes it is trial and error too. A lot of my process involved looking at places on maps that looked pretty good and then spending five or six nights there over the course of a month to see whether it yielded any results and had any promise. Um, I did also have a network of people that were, uh, you know, uh, supportive of the work I was up to that would help me as well. But uh, a lot of it was fact finding on my own. Um, so, you know, knowing your seasons is really important as well. I mentioned one species already has a very atypical active period um, and active conditions. Um, and if you don't know that, you're never going to come across a species. It just happens to be that one, um, the mountain pit viper. Um, but there's some other things that people don't necessarily consider that may or may not have an impact. I personally believe they do and um, have a lot of anecdotal experience that's almost stacked up into enough to be considered a statistical experience to back some of this up. But weather, of course. Um, you know, one thing people don't consider is it could be nice and moist and humid and everything out, but if it's blowing wind like crazy, generally speaking, that's pretty bad conditions for snakes. Anyone guess why that might affect snakes? Well, how, mu how does a snake usually find its prey? What's the first thing it uses? Scent. Yeah, scent is a pretty big one for snakes. And if the wind's blowing like crazy, it's probably not going to be great for, for using scent as a precursor for engaging a prey item. Um, and if you have a low chance of obtaining calories in a given hunting period, and your entire existence is based on obtaining and preserving calories and breeding, you've only got three pillars in your life, like some of us, um, then you're not going to waste a night burning calories where you've got a low chance of obtaining calories. Um, so uh, weather's definitely a big one. If it's too hot, it's not going to bring out the bugs. It's not going to bring out the frogs to eat the bugs no snakes to eat the frogs, so on and so forth. Um, same thing if it's too cold. Um, moon phase, why would that matter? Odd one, right? And this is debatable. A lot of debate about this one. Um, other snakes use um, crypsis uh, to secure prey. So being cryptic, hiding, kind of slowly hunting and sneaking up on their prey. Um, if you're a nighttime feeder and the ambient light is not too dissimilar from late in the day. We've all been out on the beach during big blue moons and the moon is casting shadows of us across the beach. You don't need a torch to walk around. If you're a snake that depends on um, sneaking up on something to catch it and the ambient light conditions are much brighter than normal, you've also reduced your likelihood of a successful calorie grab for the evening. So maybe you wait until things are a little bit darker to come back out. So like I said, a lot of debate there, probably need a lot more scientific data to back it up. As somebody who's out a lot, I tend to find that it's kind of true. In the middle of the jungle, less so, a lot of shade and cover. Um, anywhere there's open um, view to ambient light uh, tends to be a factor, I find. Time of year, of course, um, we don't have to get too much into that. Barometric pressure is a super interesting one. Tends to be a lead indicator for breeding behavior in a lot of species. So big drops in barometric pressures when you transition from cooler months to warmer months, when rainstorms are coming through and things like that tend to be a precursor, um, can be a good one to go out and check against um, when the barometric pressure drops. So, targeting species. So how do we actually get everything we need for a book? Um, a couple of basic ones. Research really helps. Uh, no way to get around it. And if you're 
super passionate and nerdy like me, the research is actually part of the fun. So no harm, no foul. Uh, networks and contacts, responsible networks and contacts, I should change that too. Um, you know, the scientific community is a great resource. There's normally people in there that are happy to work with people that are responsible and ethical um, that might not be part of the scientific community, but that can be a good partner and an ally in forwarding um, the causes of conservation, um, interest in the natural sciences and so on and so forth. Certainly for me, that's been a big boost, a big help and personally rewarding. Um, Hong Kong Snakes Facebook page, all members. If you're not on social media, I, I commend you. If you, are on so if you are on social media and you're not on this page, then you're missing out in life. Um, but it is a great page. Um, I'm one of the moderators with William Sargent um, and a few other. Um, Bill Sargent. Will. Will. He doesn't go by Bill. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. Um, but um, we'll, we'll get into that one later, yeah. Um, especially off camera. Um, but um, Hong Kong Snake's Facebook page is basically a page that was set up so that when somebody saw a snake in the wild, they could send a phone shot and the people in the know could tell them what species it was. It, it really caught on fire. There's um, getting upwards of 15,000 members now. Um, we're all super active on the page. I use it as a platform for education and sharing of wildlife photography to engage and inspire people to want to learn more. Um, Will and the rest of the team are really fast with IDs. Uh, and it's a really, really great uh, forum for anybody, even if you're not into snakes. It's uh, just kind of interesting to see what goes on out on the trails and sometimes in the city here in Hong Kong. Um, and testing ideas is the last one. So like I said, a lot of times I was out on my own building this book. It was probably 75% um, in the woods alone, uh, laying down in the mud on rainy nights, uh, grabbing that perfect shot. Um, and uh, a lot of time thinking about my plan. Um, I can't find this one. What am I doing wrong? What do I need to test against? Where else do I need to go? Um, should I try three in the morning this time instead of 9 p.m.? Um, do I get up at five um, and see if it's around sunrise? Um, and doing that for three and a half years, uh, give or take, uh, to try and narrow things down. So um, now this is one, I, I'm going to move through it a little bit quickly again because I'm cognizant of time, but it's something I do like to talk about um, because it's something that comes up quite a bit. Uh, there are a lot of people that are passionate about wildlife, as I am, um, and want more people to be engaged and supportive um, and uh, respectful and responsible, um, but they may be very, very intolerant of interaction with wildlife. Um, then there's people in the scientific community that do get concerned sometimes when people aren't permitted properly um, are kind of overstepping their bounds, going places, looking for rare species, stuff like that. Then there's enthusiasts that get annoyed at both of those groups for butting into their personal business. Um, and I find that all of them actually have a lot more in common than, than not. And I've always kind of struggled to reconcile my place in that sphere um, because I have respect for actually each of those, um, each of those angles on the issue. Um, so I, I, I ask myself, you know, what does it mean to be ethical in interaction with wildlife? and especially snakes. And, you know, if you look through the book, um, grabbing that photo, I didn't walk up on the snake sitting like that. Um, you know, there was a process of finding the snake responsibly and respectfully um, working with the snake to try and get a shot and then making sure that you move on and let it go about its business. But there was interaction involved and I'll never be dishonest about the fact there's interaction involved. Um, so what kind of interaction is that? What does it mean and where does it put me in the sphere? Um, well, let's talk about what it means to be ethical first and foremost um, and really go down the rabbit hole. So the, the Merriam-Webster's definition, choose your own dictionary, um, involving questions of right and wrong behavior, following accepted rules of behavior, morally right and good. A lot of wiggle room in there. Um, but if you're honest, um, maybe not as much wiggle room as you'd like to think. Um, so leading with that, I get into this. Um, you know... How do, how do the various groups look at it? Maybe we can narrow in on what it actually means to be ethical and responsible. And I look at it from starting at the top bubble here, the animal welfare bubble. These are the no touch people. These are the no interfere people. These are the don't even let it know you're there um, people. Um, you know, you should view it from afar, have a thousand millimeter telescope and, um, you know, document it with video and study it later. But don't, don't involve yourself with the wildlife. Um, there's, there's merit to that. Right. Um, you know, interacting, disturbing uh, has an effect. 
What effect, how detrimental, all that stuff, you can leave up for debate, but there's definitely an effect. And if you leave it alone, it's going to do what it was going to do when you weren't involved. That's a, that's a, a, a truth you can't avoid. Um, for me, it's a bit extreme when you go all the way to the top of the bubble there, um, but I don't disagree that there's merit to that perspective. Now, what about science? These folks tend to have a little bit more um, room to give these people some leeway to do what they do. Um, now, are scientists people who don't interfere with wildlife at all? No, <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, in a perfect world, nobody touches, looks at, is smelled by, seen, or heard by anything. Um, these guys are, the more specimens, the better, right? Get me 15 specimens instead of five. Anyone know what a specimen is? It's not alive when they're done with it, <laughs> right? Um, so if you really want to understand an animal, if you want to uh, learn more about its genetic makeup, if you want to know what it eats, you can't ask it what it had for dinner, um, right? There's a way to go about that we don't need to get into here. Um, it doesn't involve a Q&A. Um, and uh, if you want to know, you know, um, uh, across numerous specimens, what that looks like across numerous ranges, um, there's lots of information you need to obtain uh, post-mortem uh, on the animals. So you need to collect specimens. You need to have an interaction with the wildlife um, in a way that is not no touch. Um, but we all respect and understand that most of that is being done uh, to provide a better knowledge base for us to be better at interacting with these animals, protecting them, saving them, uh, helping them recover, uh, all of these great things. Maybe even finding some relationship between them and things that are useful for us as humans as well. Um, so there's, a, there's quite a lot in that that people can find um, uh, redeemable and, and justify. You don't hear a lot of people picketing out in front of HKU, stop collecting specimens. It doesn't happen. Um, but if you pick up a python in public and post it to social media, they will come kick your door down, drag you out in handcuffs, and burn you at the stake. Um, <laughs> So getting us into our public engagement sphere. Um, public engagement is um, kind of the most uh, egregious for most people. So think about things like uh, petting zoos, um, normal zoos, places where you completely contain the animal so that people can observe it and consume the experience with the animal in a completely controlled way and a binge way. Animal one, go to the next box. Animal two, animal three. Ironically, it's very easy for us to shake our heads and say, that's awful, get rid of it, it's terrible. You know, I was in Singapore recently, I spent a lot of time at Singapore Zoo. It's really hard for me to say what they're doing there is awful. Do I agree with all of it? No. Um, do I like putting um, animals in boxes? Nah, not really. Um, do I like to observe animals in boxes? Guilty pleasure? Yeah, sometimes, if the box is really nice. Um, but, um, you know, there's, there's plenty of ways you can debate that. But the reality is the result, when it's done responsibly, is lots of public engagement, especially in little kids um, who can carry that with them their entire lives and then get to these bubbles themselves and decide which one they fall into. Um, and they may have never even asked the question had they not seen that elephant at the zoo. You never know. Um, so done responsibly, done irresponsibly, all these are unacceptable. Done responsibly, there is validity to that. Um, there is a case for it, for sure. Um, and with more and more habitat destruction, sometimes you can ask, where are some of these animals going to go anyways? Um, very hot topic, very debatable. I'm not taking a position, YouTube. Um, but, um, you know, that's the, the other extreme of the bubble. So um, I consider myself as somebody who, after refining his approach over many years, really does try and sit right in the middle of these things. So I would say I'm probably the least close to the super top um, box when I'm doing work like this. When I'm not doing work like this, I probably edge a little bit closer to it. And that's because just like with the scientists collecting a specimen to produce something like this, there's an interaction required. Um, so my format of engagement um, tends to focus on um, resulting in these things. Uh, how do you get more people engaged? How do you get more people to appreciate it and be passionate about it? Um, how can you actually influence more money going into these things? Um, and how can you use all those things to help try and influence protection efforts a little bit more? Um, so for me, a lot of the work I've done has resulted in me um, delivering specimens um, to the scientific community. Um, I have worked with um, groups like these, um, including Ocean Park here, um, on a number of different things as well for education um, and for engaging the public. Um, and I've had 
many conversations with people in this box to try and better understand what a reasonable limit is, um, especially online. Um, there's lots of engagement with people in that bubble, not to change their mind, but to try and um, get everybody to understand that there is some validity to each of those. So um, it's an important topic, I think, for people engaging with wildlife to try and come to terms with before they do anything like this. Um, you know, if this entire book was just about me pinning a snake to a tree so I could get a, a good photo, uh, nobody would be happy with the end result, um, uh, least of all me. Um, so I wanted to make sure I, I knew where I stood on that as I, as I went forward with this work. There are a few things that um, I do in terms of format to be effective with this. And, you know, my photos is number one. I think if you take a beautiful image and it compels somebody to want to look at it more and learn more about the thing in the image, you've done your job um, in a way that a, a lot of scientific research papers can't do, right? You, scientific research papers sometimes produce really interesting results. It's really tough to get past the first page sometimes if you're a layman. Um, but if you see a beautiful picture of the animal being described in the paper, um, you might actually try and get past that first paragraph and say, what is this thing all about? Um, so the website is uh, the free version of this, and I made that first. So I put all of the snakes in Hong Kong up on a free website because the original intention of this uh, effort was never commercial. It was always for engagement and for public welfare. That's still up. I didn't take it down when I started selling these. I never will. It's easier to fix an update than the book as well. Um, and um, of course, the books um, are a tangible example. It's something I didn't necessarily start out thinking I would end up doing. Um, it turns out it seems to be something that a lot of people find very um, fun, engaging, interesting. Some people even call it precious. Uh, it's a tiny little book. Um, uh, but it is, it is interesting to engage something physically rather than digitally, and, and that proves that there's still life in books, Gary. Yeah. Um, so there are a few things that I think don't fit in any bubble. Um, free handling hots. We talked about what hots are at the beginning. Um, some people do this. I try not to disparage life choices of individuals. Um, and if that's what you want to do with your life, fine. Um, uh, it's playing Russian roulette. Uh, you can read an animal. You can be really good at handling a dangerously venomous snake with no tools or, or proper pro uh, precautions. Eventually, uh, a bullet winds up in the chamber and uh, the game of Russian roulette is over. Uh, usually the snake doesn't benefit from that situation and is often injured or killed in the process as well. And um, I don't really understand why you would do it. Um, so again, maybe not passing judgment, but I don't think it fits very neatly in any of these bubbles in terms of explainability. Um, killing snakes, I understand it. I do. And if you've, been if you've been raised in a place where you don't have the luxury of being exposed to conservation concepts... Um, Killing a snake is something that you might be doing to protect your family. Um, I've written about this on the snake's Facebook page when people ask why I implore them not to joke about IDs when somebody's requesting to know more about a snake. And I have a little paragraph that I write about somebody who lives in a house that's up against the jungle, isn't in a position to move or relocate their family. They see a snake by the house. They don't know what to do. Um, they look for an ID and somebody makes a joke about the state of their backyard. So they go and kill the snake because they can't worry about that sneaking into the room that it's next to where their elderly parents sleep. Um, so, you know, killing a snake, I, I don't think there's a place for it in here. I understand why it happens. And I think um, through things like the books, the websites, the Facebook page, and responsible, calm, um, considered interaction when an opportunity arises, and you see less of that. We're already seeing less of it in Hong Kong. It's really great, actually. Um, when it happens, it's also important not to persecute people for it. It's a learning experience. Um, but it's a result that doesn't fit in the bubble really well. Um, posting fake information is actually super harmful um, on this stuff. Um, there's a lot of viral videos on animals where they'll super glue um, a reptile to a tree branch and let a praying mantis attack it and, you know, all kinds of silly things like that. And, um, you know, posting information about how to identify venomous snakes that's not accurate um, all this kind of stuff. I don't think there's a home for it. Some of, a lot of it's a mistake. It's reforwarding bad information, but it's something that doesn't really have a home. And the biggest one actually could probably erase all the others. There might be mitigating circumstances. That last one is the big item in the bubble, which is poaching. Um, and we do still have serious problems with that in Hong Kong. That's taking animals out of the wild for commercial purposes, um, to sell for medicine, food, or pets. Um, and it doesn't really benefit anyone. So, um, anyways, that's a, a bit of a... Um, We'll keep moving here. It's a bit of a, uh, a, a digression, but I think it's an important topic to talk about. Um, so I think we'll be able to 
move through this part fastest because we already know the motivation. So um, we already talked about this. So I'm just going to move on. Um, you know, I started with photography, compiled a lot of information, built the website. Natural follow on became the book. Um, so it was actually a pretty organic process um, getting to this end result. Um, and really, this was a big part of it. I did want to, I always wanted to be a scientist. It's not the way my life went, um, but I wanted to be able to contribute something back to the scientific record and to posterity um, that would be considered meaningful. Um, and I'm, I'm very happy that I think this book has done that. I hope the next one uh, continues to add to that um, legacy of contribution. Um, so writing the book, this is more about um, actually how I structured the book uh, than anything else. And I tried to get cute with the graphics here, so we'll just talk about it really quickly. Um, but really, and when I started thinking about this, the website's already there. You can't just put the website on a printout. You actually have to restructure it. So there's things in here that's not on the website. Um, you know, the, the real thing for me was structure. And what I did was I went into a pages document in, on my Mac, like a Word document, and I used text boxes to place everything on the page the way I would want it to read out in the field guide, the way I would want it to be physically laid out. And then I filled in the content to the text boxes. So for me, that was a useful process um, because it helped me kind of regulate the amount of information I was uh, including, helped me identify whether I had room to add more or needed to take something out, and also helped me uh, better think about how I could utilize as many photos as possible. I, a lot of field guides, you'll have one photo of the animal um, and then a lot of text about them. And I kind of wanted this to be more balanced. I wanted really meaningful info right up front, really quickly. And then I wanted extra pages dedicated to displaying uh, compelling photographs of the animals. And that's why you see um, in the book, you know, for each species, you have the main page with the key statistics, quick summary, a little bit more detail here if you want to get a little bit further down. Um, and then you really commit the next two pages to displaying the animal. So this is the life size uh, page. This is the size they reach in maturity, which a lot of people found fun. It was a real big pain in the butt to figure that out. Um, and uh, then you have the gallery where you try and display as much uh, interesting and useful uh, photographic information as possible. So um, having that structure all laid out at the beginning it became quite easy to actually write the book. Who wants to guess how many days it took me to write the actual text for the book? 400. 400 days. You were way closer on the other guessing. It, the, the actual first full clean draft took me three days. Three days. Um, now, remember, I'd written the web page. Um, everything was top of mind. Um, editing, organizing, rewriting, um, respelling, like, like choosing different wording and all that. That took several months. Um, but getting the draft actually written, I literally had a pot of coffee on continuous boil. Um, and I did 20 hour days for three days in a row. I'm a bit of a momentum guy anyway, so I don't know if it would have gotten done if I hadn't done it that way. Um, but um, yeah, it was, it was really quick once you had all the information. Um, no research required. Do I have to? We've got about five minutes for questions. Got it, uh, got it. the podcast will come. <laughs> okay, so I think, so I think we can wrap it up. Chance. I think we can wrap it up there. And yeah. the only last thing I'd like to say is the newest book out is on turtles. Um, <laughs> So Turtles, there was extra love that went into the physical creation of the book. We chose text uh, inspired by herpetological text from the 1700s. I commissioned a, a young guy who's getting into wildlife illustration in Singapore to do artistic plates of the native species at the beginning. And then we followed a similar format to the Snakes book in terms of information layout. Um, and we have some very rare, very vulnerable species of native turtle in Hong Kong, which most of you will have never seen because they're very secretive. Um, I think it's a lovely topic for people to learn more about because these are really, really important animals to protect and they are under threat from poaching um, and things like that. So learn more, love them more. Um, book is fine. They're also on the website, top secret information. So cheers. All right. I just want to thank Adam Francis for a fantastic talk. Very engaging. Very good. Very good. And, uh, so.